55 in the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Gloria is found in the hymnal S277. and the mountain smoking, they were afraid 
and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you do not sin. Here ends the reading. We continue with Psalm number 19. Uh, find it in your Book of Common Prayer on page 606. Please respond at the asterisk. The heavens declare the glory of God, and, and the, the firmament shows His handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one, one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and, and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all lands, and their, their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set pavilion for the sun. It comes, comes forth like a bride out of his chamber. It, it rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing, Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The, the testimony, testimony of the Lord is sure and, and gives wisdom to the innocent. innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The, the commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not put dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and the innocent of great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Continue with the reading of the epistle from the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of his church, as to Righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard that everything as lost because of the surprising value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, 
I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading. Our sequence hymn this morning is a new song for us here. It's printed in the PDF of the bulletin that was sent out on Friday. In perfect charity, if you're following along with the bulletin, we'll sing verses 1 and 2. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of 
all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. This week, I had the sad honor of celebrating the life of one of our most beloved parishioners, Walt Dirks. In preparing for his service, which was small, limited to pretty much the family, I looked for the readings and the hymns and the prayers that would best reflect this life. I spent some time reviewing my own memories as well as Walt's obituary. If you knew Walt, you know that this is an impressive document. Walt loved sailing and telling stories, and at least in the last few years, holding court in that back table of the split rail. Raised in Brooklyn during World War II, Walt Dirks was a tall, handsome boy with a gift for sports. He was an all-star basketball player at Roanoke College. And he was invited to turn pro, but instead chose a career in the pharmaceutical industry. After two years of dating, he married his beloved wife, Sue. Somewhere in their 67 years of love, they adopted two sons, welcomed daughters-in-law and grandchildren and great-grandchildren into their family. Walt's career was very successful by any measure you would care to apply to it, including a moral measure. Through his expertise and commitment, Walt helped to usher in an antiviral drug that has become key in the fight against HIV-AIDS. Despite the great success in a high-paying, high-profile industry, Walt took greater pleasure and satisfaction after retirement, when he was asked to serve as a substitute middle school teacher. Here, the strengths and virtues he honed over a lifetime of work in the private sector were put to good use helping young people to grow and learn. Can you imagine the raw material he found in teaching for telling some of his more terrific stories? Of course, if you knew Walt, you don't have to imagine that because you've heard him tell them. Or maybe you've read some of his stories in his 2018 memoir, Fragments. Yes, indeed. Our beloved Walt had a full life, a good life, by every standard and measure. And our hearts are very much with Sue and her family as they grieve this painful loss. Thinking about Walt this week, I was reminded of a 2015 article by New York Times columnist David Brooks. The article is called The Moral Bucket List. By his own admission, it's kind of a gimmicky title, but the content of the essay is anything but. Brooks describes what he calls resume virtues versus eulogy virtues. He would expand this idea into a series of talks, including a powerful 2017 TED Talk called Should You Live for Your Resume or Your Eulogy? In his five-minute presentation, Brooks describes resume virtues as the ones you put on your resume, which are the skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that get mentioned in the eulogy, which are deeper. Who are you in your depth? What is the nature of your relationships? Are you bold, loving, dependable, consistent? He goes on to quote the famous rabbi, Joseph Solevichik, whose 1965 book, A Lonely Man of Faith, was an important source for Brooks' understanding. Rabbi Solevichik talks about two characters inside of every person, two characters who are at war with each other. He calls them Adam One and Adam Two. Adam One is the worldly, ambitious, external side of our nature. He wants to build, create, create companies, create innovation. Adam Two is the humble side of our nature. Adam Two wants not only to do good, but to be good, to live in a way internally that honors God, creation, and our possibilities. Adam one wants to conquer the world. Adam two wants to hear a calling and obey the world. Adam one savors accomplishment. Adam two savors inner consistency and strength. Adam one asks, how 
things work, Adam too asks why we're here. Adam 1's motto is success. Adam 2's motto is love, redemption, and return. Both Brooks and Selevichek's observations gave me some insight into this morning's epistle reading. We remember that last week in his letter to the Christians in Philippi, Paul wrote about the need for humility, using Christ's self-emptying obedience to God as the primary example for our own lives. This week, Paul elaborates on what this means. He starts off with his own Adam 1 description, a list of his resume virtues, at least in the eyes of faithful Jewish people in the first century Palestine and beyond. He was entered into covenant with God, he says, through circumcision, just as all good eight-day-old boys are supposed to be. He had the perfect and proper heritage, tracing his lineage through both parents back to one of the most prestigious and respected tribes. He dedicated his career to the study of the law and became a Pharisee, an expert with the very highest pedigree. He applied his knowledge with zeal into persecuting followers of the way as the earliest Jesus people were known. Paul was, by the outward measures of his own community, an Adam one success story. Now, before we make the usual error that Christian interpreters throughout the centuries have made in contemning Paul's Jewishness, we read through the lens of centuries of Christian political dominance, we need to step back and see how we, in our own contexts, do more or less the same. How many of us lean on our heritage, our place of birth, our family of origin, tracing our parents' line back to the 18th century or the 17th century, the direct descendants of this named family or that named family, as a way of displaying our inherent worth? Because that's what Paul is doing here. And then, how many of us refer to our alumni status from this or that college or university to imply a special kind of value, a sort of intellectual superiority? And then again, how many of us begin conversations with new people using the ubiquitous question of, so, what do you do, as a way of comparing our relative worth based on what our professions may be? Our nation, our culture, is an Adam one kind of culture. Driving around Connecticut, one can't help noticing these days all of these signs that say Woodbury Strong, or Oxford Strong, or America Strong, as a response to our current pandemic. We want to project our power and strength to show this unified wall without a single crack in it. That's true for us as a nation, and it's true for us as individuals. We love to post our own highlights reel in the annual Christmas letter or on social media or on any platform where we can show the world how great, how successful our lives have become. Our Adam One resume lives are built on honing and, this is key, showing off our strengths. All of this reminds me, I have to say, of the kind of displays that bucks and wild turkeys make at this time of year to demonstrate their own strength and value to potential mates. And it does work to a certain extent. Strength and determination are very important when it comes to basic survival. But surviving is not the same as fullness of life. Indeed, according to David Brooks, an untempered Adam one life makes us into shrewd animals who treat life as a game. In order to win this game, he says, we must become cold, calculating creatures. By contrast, the Adam to eulogy writing nature requires something else entirely. In order to receive the true benefits of a life well lived, you have to, to surrender to something outside yourself to gain strength, true strength, within yourself. In order to find yourself, 
You have to lose yourself. Paul, as we've said, was very successful in his career as a Pharisee. The problem comes when valuing external success experiences some kind of limit, when our drive to be a winner crashes into a wall. For Paul, that moment came on the road to Damascus, when he was literally blinded by the light of what true strength looks like. Hitting this kind of wall can come at any time of our lives. For St. Francis of Assisi, it came relatively early. We remember Francis now for living a life of poverty, devotion, and service. We remember his self-emptying humility, and we celebrate him in stories about his love and care for all of God's creatures. That's why we hold the blessing of the animals every year to honor his life and work. What makes this story so powerful, at least to my mind, is his transition, his conversion, from being a consummate Adam one guy into the very icon of an Adam two. Giovanni de Bernardone was born into fabulous wealth. He was renamed Francesco by his father, a name that spoke of the kind of commercial success associated with all things French. Francesco di Bernadone lived the life of an A-list celebrity, experiencing maybe the occasional pang of conscience when his life of wealth encountered the desperate and ubiquitous poverty of 13th century Assisi. But his arrogance and drive for fame covered over his pangs and led him to join a military expedition to nearby Perugia. The triumph he imagined, however, didn't exactly work out, and young Francesco crashed into his own wall when he was taken prisoner, spending the next year of his life as a captive of the very people he despised. While a prisoner, Francesco became very ill. How his Adam I and Adam II must have battled in this moment of defeat. A year of incapacity did being incapacitated gives a guy a lot of time to think over his life choices, to reflect on the sins that drove him into the wall in the first place, to reevaluate an entire life. It's this time of self-reflection where we go into ourselves undistracted by the glamour of external successes. It's in these moments that our minds gravitate toward our own pasts, and particularly the parts that we're not really very proud of. Where we examine the repetition of our bad behavior, we see the patterns of our own sinfulness and reflect on its impact in our own lives and in the lives of others. Do we have the habit of selfishness or anger, the sin of self-pity or trying to be a people pleaser, the sin of vanity or the sin that comes from the lack of no and wonder Adam one resists this kind of reflection. Interior work can be and often is hard, painful, even overwhelming. But it's in these openings, these times of reflection, it's in these cracks where the light of God shines in. When Francesco was relieved and returned to Assisi, he was no longer interested in the party in life. He began to see that the time that looked like a punishment was actually a gift. The cracks in his life led him ultimately to a change of mind to the metanoia that led to a 180 degree turn. He rejected the life of luxury and embraced what he called lady poverty. And the rest of the story, I think you know. In the language of Paul, the gains Francesco, Francis, had made became regarded as loss because of his relationship with Christ. Francis and Paul abandoned their own lives, experienced what Paul calls a death, a death of the old self, of the need to succeed. Now, at this point, you may be saying to yourself, 
that all of this endless navel-gazing does not really get much done. It doesn't feed the children or get them educated. It doesn't make sure that the crops grow and are harvested. It doesn't help make and enforce the laws that give our society order. It doesn't volunteer at the food pantry. It doesn't encourage the disenfranchised to vote. It doesn't do the work needed to build God's kingdom, and I agree. Our resume lives endow us with skills and gifts and determination, and all of these things are indeed values. All of these things are indeed virtues. But in order to experience the true fullness of life, to share in the resurrection of Christ, Adam 1 and Adam 2 must be reconciled. They must form and guide one another. Strength must be accompanied by reflection and a willingness to change and develop the kinds of virtues which give our characters depth. The integrated life is like a stone rejected by builders, a stone that does not appear on the outside to have value, but which in fact has the kind of structural integrity to hold up an entire building. In ourselves and in our world, we have seen the limits of an Adam One society. We have watched how the might makes right resume puffing attitude creates deep suffering. We have experienced how unexamined sins have the power to hurt other people and ourselves. And we have seen what happens when we pause and reflect on where things went wrong. To my way of thinking, it's one of the worst and best aspects of this pandemic. But there is time to reflect, to observe the places where our own lives and the life of the world has hit a wall and cracked open as a result. And, and we have seen what happens when we do the hard work of repentance, when we use the skills we developed in our Adam 1 lives, shaped by the insight of Adam 2, to become builders in the city of God. I close this morning with words from the great theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, who gives us a vision of what a life and a world would be where Adam 1 and Adam 2 are fully integrated. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as from our own standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by that final form of love, which is forgiveness. May it be true for you and for me. In the name of God. Amen. We continue our worship this morning with the Nicene Creed, as together we recall the promises made at our baptism. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of monogamy, of one being the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made a man. For our sake, he was crucified on a conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and 
is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father to the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. We have spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection from the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people. The Christian church is the vineyard of the Lord with all its needs and problems. Growing the grapes, making the wine, managing the Lord's work. Let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. That the fruit of our common prayer and ministry be the Eucharistic wine, which will soon unite all in Christ the vine and make us one. Let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard. Lord, hear our prayer. That our leaders in both church and state may accept their stewardship and accountability to God, and that there may be a rich harvest, let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard. Lord, hear our prayer. That the peace of God which is beyond all understanding, may lift from our suffering world its burdens of anxiety, war, violence, oppression, poverty, and disease, and that God's fruitfulness will give life to all in need. Let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Lord's vineyard may quickly extend its healthy branches to the world, sheltering the people with Christ's gentleness and loving kindness. Let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That Jesus, the stone which the builders rejected, may be recognized as the keystone of church and creation. Let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For those we remember in the cycle of prayer, Christ Church Trumbull, Grace Church Trumbull, Trinity Trumbull, and for all companions and service animals, all livestock and wild animals, great and small, let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard. Lord, hear our prayer. For the good things in our lives, for Pete Miseradino, Maya Brazustis, Oliver Cusano, John Parkhurst, and Sarah Simmons, who are celebrating a birthday this week, let us pray to the Lord of the vineyard. We give thanks to you, O Lord. I now invite your intercessions for thanksgiving, offered out loud or in the silence of our hearts. This morning we offer special prayers of thanksgiving for Arthur Fraioli, whose baptism we will celebrate this afternoon. Lord, thanks be to God. Lord of the harvest, we pray that our global Christian community may fulfill your son's prayer, and that we may soon be one in the name of Christ, as he is in you, his Father, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ.
Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Thank you. Wherever you are, I hope you extend a sign of peace to those who are nearby and those who are far. We have a few announcements this morning. As we mentioned in the homily and in the prayers of the people, today is the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, and we will celebrate that with the annual blessing of the animals. That will be outside the church on the patio today at noon. We ask that all animals be leashed or appropriately restrained, uh, and that all people wear masks. So that's today at noon. Bring your fuzzy friend and uh, receive a blessing. I wanted to mention that we had scheduled a forgiveness workshop for today at uh, 4 o'clock with Dan Gates, and that workshop has been postponed. So we will look forward to hosting that again in January. I also wanted to share that the first week of our Feeding Families Northwest program has been a great success. And thanks to all the volunteers, and especially to Marianne Daly, who is coordinating our volunteers. If you would like to volunteer to be part of this fabulous food delivery system, please reach out to Mary Ann Daly. If you would like to make a contribution to support the feeding of hungry families in the Waterbury area, you can make a check directly to St. Paul's Church, Feeding Families Northwest, in the memo line. Finally, I wanted to share some good news. We are working on replacing our sort of temporary system of live streaming with something that's more permanent and more durable. Thanks be to God. We'll look forward to having consistent, beautiful sound and images of both the sanctuary and of the organ loft and choir. So we are looking at having this done very soon. We are soliciting donations from the congregation to help us cover the cost of this. The total cost will be about $7,000. We have some donors who've already come forward. We are looking at how to allocate money from, uh, from our most recent request. And we are going to ask you if you would like to help contribute to making a durable, high quality live stream and audio system for our church that we can use during the pandemic and for years to come. We know that live streaming has become an important part of how we worship and how we are stay together as a community. If you're interested in making a gift toward this, please put uh, write a check to St. Paul's Church, and you can put um, uh, live stream equipment or AV equipment in the memo line, and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. Thank you so much for your continued support. You've been so faithful in tuning in, even as we have struggled in so many ways to uh, make worship happen. And I am, from the bottom of my heart, grateful to you. I'm also, from the bottom of my heart, grateful to Rustin Pace, who has so faithfully been here and done so much to help us get this set up and to keep it running. Uh, Russ, I have no idea how I would do this without you, so thank you. Our offertory hymn this morning is number 458 in the hymnal, My Song is Love Unknown. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 7, hymn number 458.
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Be with you. 